My name is Tom Duver, and I'm a professor of chemical engineering here at Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm also the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Architectural Science. My background is that I hold a bachelor's and a master's and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Waterloo. An interesting fact about myself is I was actually born in Germany and came to Canada when I was 17 years old. Chemical engineering, in my opinion, is one of the broadest engineering disciplines. Chemical engineers design, implement, and supervise processes in which matter is transformed in some way. And so a lot of examples, there are a lot of examples, the very traditional uh, processes that uh, people think about, I think when they think about chemical engineering, are petrochemical processes. Of course, people don't realize that it's not just about produ producing gasoline and diesel fuel and so forth, but many other feedstocks for other uh, production processes like plastics, for example. Um, but there are, there are many other areas and, and, and fields in which chemical engineers work, like pulp and paper, production of polymers, which I mentioned already, food engineering, biochemical engineering, which includes things like the production of pharmaceuticals. Uh, they also work in the energy sector, uh, and there are m many, many other applications. Another thing that you could, another way in which you can think about chemical engineering is, or chemical engineers, is that they are also referred to as process engineers. And a process can be anything. And so you find chemical engineers working, for example, in the financial industry, because you can think about financial transactions as a process and apply the principles that chemical engineers are trained in. Well, I think chemical engineers are, play a very important role in the Canadian economy because you'll find chemical engineers active in almost all sectors of our, uh, of our industries. So this includes, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, petrochemical sector, pulp and paper, the food industry, uh, the chemical engineers work on issues related to climate change. They work in the automotive sector uh, and pharmaceuticals and so on. So it's, they're, they're pervasive throughout uh, acti the, act the economic activity that's occurring in the country. I'm, I'm particularly interested these days in uh, changes that might be occurring to the way engineering curricula are going to be um, delivered. So, you know, we're, we're talking about different modes of delivery. We've learned through the pandemic, for instance, we've learned a little bit at least about online delivery. And, uh, and I'm not suggesting that we're, we're going to migrate to online delivery, but uh, there certainly is an opportunity for us to do perhaps more hybrid learning uh, perhaps um, more flipped classrooms, uh, just different, different modes of delivery and also maybe a different approach where we use more open-ended problem-based case studies for, for, the, for the learning, for the teaching of, of chemical engineering. Uh, I think we also want to, want to talk about, you know, we want to look at the more, more flexibility for our students and addressing uh, the, the needs of our students and what, they, what they're really, really interested in. The other developments that are very interesting, very, very, very relevant right now, for instance, is uh, the impact that artificial intelligence is going to have on our on our curriculum and on the way we teach uh, teach students. For instance, lots of lots of talk these days about uh, Chat GPT and whether uh, whether we should ban that or should we embrace it or what what do we do? And personally, I think you know it kind of reminds me actually of. When I was, when I was a, a, a young undergraduate student and the question of were we allowed to use a calculator on an exam or not, it's kind of like that because these technologies are going to be developed and uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to figure out how we, how we use them, how we incorporate them and what the parameters are going to be. So, so that, those, are, those are some of the things I'm, I'm looking at and observing and uh, with great interest actually. I'm going to tell you about two, actually. Uh, the first one, uh, I remember being a third year student. I just completed third year and I was working, I was on a work term working for uh, Kimberly 
Clark, which had a craft pulp mill in Terrace Bay, Ontario, in Northern Ontario. And I was working in what was called the technical department, which was essentially the engineering department. And it was very uh, sparsely staffed. They didn't have a lot of engineers on staff. So as a third year student, you really got, uh, got thrown into the thick of things and, and, and had to take on projects more or less on your own. And so one of the areas that they, uh, that they had me work in was the heat recovery area. So in a, in a craft pulping process, essentially you're cooking uh, uh, wood chips in a, in, a, in a chemical solution at high heat and then uh, at the end of the process you'll you'll blow the reactor out and, and blow the pulp and, and the liquid out of it and a lot of heat, heat is released in that process and you want to recover that heat and so one of the projects that I was asked to to work on was an optimization of the heat recovery system and that was a was a great project uh, it involved uh, working with uh, with an outside company doing a lot of simulations and coming up with uh, with an approach and a design that allowed us to recover, uh, uh, I think about 80% of the heat that was being released. So that was a great project for a third year engineering student. Later on, um, uh, as, a, as a faculty member, I had the opportunity to work, uh, one of my PhD students was actually the vice president of a small company that made hydrogen peroxide based disinfectants for hospitals. So these were disinfectants that were used to um, to treat uh, equipment that, that doctors would use. And our job was, his, his job, the project that we worked on was to come up with a rapid way of producing uh, new formulations depending on what the requirements were. And so we did a, a lot of interesting work to, to come up with, with an algorithm for doing that and, uh, and significantly cut down the costs, uh, the development costs that the company would ordinarily uh, incur. So those are a couple of a couple of memorable projects that I've been involved with. Yeah, so a lot of people, I think a lot of students in particular, don't know what a dean does. Uh, and I would say that a good way to think of a dean is as the chief executive officer of the faculty. So I, I'm involved in, in hiring faculty and staff. I get involved in admission and recruitment of, of students, so I oversee uh, our admissions and recruitment group. Uh, I'm involved with um, maintaining the quality of our programs. I also get involved with the development and implementation of new programs in the faculty. And um, my job also involves uh, advancements, so fundraising. Uh, I'm also responsible for, for the budget of the, of the faculty. And as a, as, a, as a dean, I'm also an officer of the university, so I, I have responsibilities and get involved for university-wide initiatives, for collaborations with other faculties. And I'm also, uh, I also represent the faculty to the external world, so to alumni, to industrial partners, to other universities. Um, so those are, those are some of the responsibilities, the majority of the responsibilities that I have. to pay attention to what some people call the soft skills, I like to call them durable skills. These are things like leadership, communication, collaboration, teamwork, and so on. You know, I, I read a, a very interesting book recently uh, that's written by the actor Alan Alda, uh, who it turns out he's, he's well known for that old TV series, MASH, but he's also, it turns out, has a great interest in science communication and, uh, and hosted, for instance, the Scientific American Discovery Show that was on PBS a number of years ago. And he has developed and, and looked at the use of improv for helping scientists and engineers communicate better. And the, 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 the issue is that if you cannot express yourself well, and if you can't explain to non-engineers what it is you're doing and what your solution is all about, you're not going to be very effective. And so I think communication skills are extremely important if you're going to be successful. It's, it's well known that the engineering curriculum is, is, uh, is packed. There's a lot going on. And I think for new students that are, that are just starting, 
My first piece of advice is make sure you find a good study group. Find people that you can, you can work with and, and, and work together because that's the key to success in, in engineering is teamwork and, 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 and uh, working with others. Sure, you have to, do, you have to understand uh, what, what's being taught yourself, but it doesn't hurt to study with others and, and work together with others. So that's one thing. The other thing I would really encourage you is to um, look beyond your, your classes, look beyond your, your, your courses, because there are many, many things going on within the faculty and within the university. So we have a lot of teams, a lot of societies that you can, you can work with. And I think you also learn a lot from, from those activities, from these extracurricular or co-curricular activities. And finally, I think my advice is that uh, take care of yourself. Uh, make sure you get enough sleep, make sure you eat well, and make sure you get enough exercise because you really, you really, it's really, really important that, that you, you look after yourself and uh, look after your well-being.